And they say, well, it's studies the allocation of resources. Well, this is, this is the same thing, right? We've got a tie. Let's figure out how to allocate. Who gets which speech? Now, if I come to a party, we're all sitting around, and I bring a pizza. Right? We all kind of think that it's okay that everybody get what? The same share. Like the father brings home in the evening a pie, and I'm going to bake the cake, and we put the cake in the middle, and the kid's always fighting. You know, you have to cut it up exactly the same. You should all get the same. Maybe the guy who bought the pizza gets a bit of a bit bigger piece. But if he ate the whole pizza, we'd say, well, wait, where did you get the pie? Right? The whole point. We have to share the pizza and to get equal pieces or something approximating equal pieces. Well, we've got an extra pie. Why shouldn't we all get the same piece? I mean, you should get the same piece, and you should get the same piece. What's special about any of you? Why so cool? It's special about me. Why should I get a piece of piece than anybody else? Now, what's wrong with that? I can't see this. What's wrong with, with, the, with the pie? Why's that wrong? Well, there are lots of reasons. But one, they assume the pie is static. They assume the pie is just big, a given size, and we just have to divvy it up. They don't take into account that the pie, economic activity, economic wealth, is growing. It grows. Wealth is created. People have a hard time conceptualizing the, conceptualizing the idea that wealth is indeed created. It doesn't just come into existence. I mean, one of the stories that you can tell people about how wealth is created it's just history. History is a great story. Small pieces of history, big chunks of history. Because once upon a time, like 300 years ago, was there a big pie? What was the size of the pie 300 years ago? There were only about less than half a billion people on the planet Earth. And they didn't live very long, so there was a lot of turnover. And average income was what? Was at the level today of what we consider extreme poverty, or what the United Nations considers extreme poverty. Not an organization I usually cite, but in this case, they have useful statistics. How many people, 300 years ago, lived at $2 a day or less in the world? Pretty much everybody, 95 to 99 percent. Hard to tell exactly. Everybody was extremely poor. And then something amazing happened, right? For 100,000 years, we were all basically extremely poor. And suddenly, out of nowhere, many of us became fantastically rich. Now, if the pie is not growing, then where did all that wealth come from? If the pie is fixed, if it doesn't expand, then how did we become rich? By exploiting whom? By stealing from whom? By taking from what? And we all got rich. Anybody know what percentage of the world population today lives on two dollars a day or less? And all inflation adjusted, I'm not cheating. Eight percent, less than ten. Eight percent. So how did that happen? We went from ninety-nine to less than 10. And indeed, over the last 30 years, just over the last 30 years, in some of your lifetimes, the number of people who have come out of extreme poverty has declined or come out of extreme poverty is over a billion people. We've gone from 30% of the world population to 8% of the world population. I mean, that is the most exciting, positive story that nobody talks about, that nobody tells, that nobody writes about. We should be celebrating in the streets rather than convinced that the world is going to end tomorrow. As the young generation seems to be. And why does nobody celebrate in the streets? Because what caused this massive decline of poverty? Part A, 
Socialism, redistribution of wealth, now just a little bit of freedom. Under the law, a little bit. Imagine what a lot could do. A little bit of freedom in places like China, India, South Korea, Taiwan, in Asia, even in Africa, places like Rwanda, Botswana, Namibia, that are starting to rise out of poverty because they've got the rule of law, some property rights, some, imagine if they really have full blown freedom. So the pie is obviously not static, it's growing. But it's more than that. How we divide the pie is going to determine how much we grow. If we, we even fight the pie, right? How the pie is divided determines how fast we will grow, where we will grow, how we will grow. Fact is that economic growth is a phenomenon of saving. Right? Who saves? Who consumes? All of those kind of decisions are going to impact the way economies grow. So this pie is static, is not static. And how we divide it has an impact on how fast and where it will grow. But that's not really the problem. There's a much deeper problem with that. Like this is a national wealth, GDP, any aggregate economic number that tries to calibrate all the wealth and all the income in the economy. What's the real problem with the pie? The problem with the pie is that it doesn't exist. There is no pie. I know you might get your pie. And you might bake a pie, and I might bake a pie, but all we have are individual pies. All we have is individual wealth. All we have is individual income. And economists, because they like numbers and they like to aggregate numbers, they can aggregate all those numbers and say, here's the national wealth. But the nation has no wealth. You have wealth, and you have wealth, and you have wealth. And who the hell are they to take my pie? Crunch it up with everybody else's pie to create a collective pie. There's no such thing as a national economy. There's no such thing as GDP. Not really. Not as a thing. Just as a number that we use to aggregate. So we can hold down our minds, but when you start treating it as a thing, the nation, you know, Serbia has X amount of billions of dollars. Now I have to decide who gets what. That's the kind of collectivistic thinking that destroys us. And that's the kind of taking our property away from us that makes it possible for them to get away with it. They assume that your property is not yours. They assume that all property implicitly is collectively owned. It belongs to everybody. It's part of this big pie. But if you recognize the individual big pie, for themselves, then take your hands off of my pie. My pie is not yours. Don't steal my pie. Leave my money, my wealth, my property, myself alone. Too many people talk in these collectivistic terms. Most economists, of course, talk as if the nation does stuff. You know, maybe one of the one of the most uh, most important of these discussions is happening right now in the United States. The United States has a trade deficit with China. Right? We hear that all the time. Trade deficits. So first, the United States doesn't trade with China. The United States doesn't trade with China. I trade with China. I trade with some Chinese guy. I don't even trade with China. There's some Chinese guy assembling iPhones. And he gets paid for that, and he, you know, basically a Chinese company he has the iPhone, and they ship it to me. And I trade with this Chinese company. There's no trade going on between America and China. Not in any real sense. So, get away from these nationalistic, collectivistic concepts. Individuals trade. And if I want to trade with some Chinese guy, why 
Why is it in your business? Why is it in your safe business? Why is it in anybody's business? He did it voluntarily. I'm doing it voluntarily. We're trading, which means, what does it mean when you trade? Mutual benefit. Win-win. I'm better off, and he's better off. But out. None of your business. Stay away. Countries don't trade. Countries don't produce. Countries don't have wealth. Only individuals trade, produce, and have wealth. So, of course, the other fallacy with the trade deficit is anybody here go shopping in the grocery store? Everybody? You have a massive trade deficit with the grocery store. <laughs> it's terrible. You like go to the grocery store every day, you leave your money there, you take stuff, and they never hire you back. Yes, we have genes. 
Yes, I'm blind and mad, but you know what? We're human beings, therefore we can overcome both of those. We can shape our own lives. We are moral agents. We are capable of shaping our own character, making our own choices, deciding what we want to do with our lives. And some of us choose to produce lots of wealth and have the ability to do it. And some of us don't, for all kinds of reasons. All kinds of reasons. Some of us just don't enjoy our stuff and spend millions of dollars. I know that's hard to believe. Although typically free market people are far less materialistic than Marx. Socialists only think in terms of money. Leftists only think in terms of money. But some of us, a lot of the speakers here today, chose to be teachers instead of making money. Because you can't get <laughs> You can try. If you're Jordan Peterson, maybe you can. But other than Jordan, nobody else can do it. Right? But we love this. I say I love this. More than millions of dollars, which I've literally walked away from in order to do this. But we get to choose, and we do build it. So Obama says it's not just your visa and your but also you drove on the roads to get to work, so you owe society. Make it 
impossible for us to live in the most prosperous era in all of human history with gadgets. Gadgets like this, supercomputers in our pockets, amazing technology, telecommunication tools, entertainment tools that we just carry around as if it's nothing. Somebody had to build this. Somebody did deal with this. We are led to believe that they are the villains. They are not the villains. They're the greatest benefactors of mankind that mankind has ever had. They've improved the lives of everybody more than any other human beings on the planet. More than politicians, more than generals, more than anybody. If we want to celebrate anybody, it should be the businessmen, the successful businessmen, who have actually created the products and services that make our lives better. Take out the cronies and deal with them. But the majority of them did build it, must be left alone. And we need to get away from this collectivistic view of the economics, of the economy, of politics. At the end of the day, all that exists are individuals. At the end of the day, you're responsible for your life, you're responsible for your cake, for your pie. Make the most of it. You're not. You don't own my pie because you happen to be in the same color skin. You don't own my pie because you happen to be in the same ethnic group. You don't own my pie because you happen to live in the same geography. You don't own my pie because you happen to have the same government. Each one of our pies is ours, and that is sacred. And we don't redistribute, even if somebody can, you know, in some science fiction novel can pretend that some better world would happen. It won't. It's a disaster. <laughs> so inequality is just another one of those tools that the collectivists use in order to take our stuff in order to regulate our lives, in order to control us. And in the name of individualism, in the name of property rights, in the name of our right to our own life, and to live it as we see fit as individuals, we need to say, keep your hands off my pie, go to hell, leave me alone, let me live. I think they have to give the message, so you, it's, up, it's up to us to go and convey it. And I think, to again talk back to what Kibbe said, what Kibbe said, um, we, need it, we need to be really good at telling stories and trying to inspire. And if all the economics, we need to know the economics, and we need to know the politics, and we need to know that. But much more important than that is the idea of, I think, morality, and the idea that your life is yours, and that your moral purpose should be to live the best life that you can live. And then it inspires you to start thinking in terms of your own life and the damage that is done by the collectivism out there, by the statism out there, to their own life. But the primary has to be the pursuit of happiness. The primary has to be, I'm living to, for a good life. And, and the politics and everything is just an auxiliary. And if we just need to convey that message and use the right kind of inspiring language and inspiring stories to, to get it across. There's certain people that are beyond reason and therefore should be ignored. There's no point in speaking to people who truly hate it. Uh, have decided psychologically, philosophically, for whatever reason, that they are, they are destroyers and they're, they're not interested. These ideas. I think that's a minority of these ideas. I don't think that's the majority of people. I think the real focus should be for people, and this is why I think folks should be in young people. People, before they've made up their mind, before they've committed, when they're still open to new ideas, when they're willing to be radical. I mean, after a certain age, I hate to say this, but after a certain age, kind of the mind gets calcified, and, and partially it's time. You get a job and you get a family and there's just things going on in your life. And you have time to think big thoughts and to, and to think about radical ideas when you get to that age and to that point in your life. And partially it's it's habit. You, 
you've got a habit of thinking in a particular way, it's hard to break that habit. So we got to get people young, high school, college, early professionals, we've got to get them with an ideal, we've got to present an ideal, a moral ideal, a political ideal, a social ideal, something that they can really believe in and strive towards. And again, as people become older, they become cynical. Oh, well, you know, it's not that worse time for that. When we're young, we're still looking for truth. And at the end of the day, the pursuit is a pursuit of truth. We've got to catch people when they're that. And I think that's the driving population. I still think that you can get young people engaged and thinking at a young age about ideas and about fundamental questions like who does your life belong to? What, what, what is the purpose of your life? Uh, then I think you can have a huge I think this is why people like Jordan Peterson are so popular and so successful because they're appealing to young people with the question of, about meaning. I mean, I think his answers are superficial. They're not very interesting. But the question is an important question that I think a lot of young people are struggling with. And that's an opportunity for us to fill that void. Okay. This is the end of the day. This is a young people's movement. And it has to be a young people's movement. And always will be a young people's movement to some extent. You know, we're there to help and to teach and to, to motivate and to provide knowledge and wisdom or whatever. Uh, but at the end of the day, roots on the ground are going to be young people who, you know, the future is more yours than mine. It wasn't that way than it is. Um, and, and, you know, you've got what's taking. And your futures are more dependent. And as, in a sense, the world, I think, descends into more and more controls and more and more authoritarianism, I, you've got more at stake. And so I, I, I do think it's, it has to be a movement of young people. Again, at some point you get married and you have kids and all of that stuff. Some of us can make a living doing this, and therefore we can continue to be involved. But most people, in a sense, are going to drop off of the movement. They might be involved into community technology, they might be involved in terms of financial contributions, and, Get involved in, in a variety of ways, but in terms of boots on the ground, it's always going to be the, the young that, that, uh, the, you know, that, that are actively pursuing it on a day to day basis. Yeah, man, just to follow up on that, I, I think one of the things that is important when you're young to think about is to, to not attach yourself to a particular geography. Um, you know, the world is an amazing place. There are lots of opportunities. Uh, the, the, there are lots of opportunities to make yourself better, to make yourself freer, to, to take advantage of stuff. The way you're born is a complete accident. Who, who cares? Right? It's, and, and you should, from a, I think from a relatively young phase, start thinking about where do I really want to live? I mean, I remember, to me it happened after meeting Alan Shrug, right, when I was 16, which I hope everybody should read. Um, I read Armstrong and then it said, oh, this is about my life, not the tribes, not the communities, not other people, this is about my life. Do I really want to live here? I was living in Israel at the time. Is this the place I want to live? No, why would I, if I actually chose where to live, would that be the first option? No, clearly not. Uh, you know, so I moved. And I lived in California a few years ago and my tax bill was getting bigger and bigger and bigger and I thought again. Do I really need to live in California? This is the best place in the world for me to live right now and pay 55% taxes. You know, I look really hard for this one. And the answer is no. There are places I can live where I don't do this and I don't give up anything. So, thank you. Now I live in Puerto Rico. So, if you have that kind of attitude that I am in control of my life, I am going to make the choices, I am going to make the decisions, the world is open. What this is open now is just going to be, you know, could be more open. And I'm going to try to go to the best damn place I can go to live my life because you only have one shot at it. You don't get a retry. You don't get a do over. You don't get any second back. Every second pass is gone. So make the most of every second you have. Yeah, I, mean, I, don't, I don't think it's ultimately sustainable. So I think there are only two equal liberties, equal freedom, and slavery. And either everything declines and everything goes to hell, or 
building a slow over the day out of because as long as people have enough freedom to figure out ways to get around the controls, they will find ways to get around the controls. So, and, and the more people get around the controls, they are the more the ultimately the So I'm, I'm, I, you know, I'm more of an educator, so my job is to get more people to take the freedom, right? more people to be the So I go out and I speak to people who don't have it, right? who are not committed to it. And I think you can convince people about the value of freedom. I don't think it's that hard, but it, 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 takes, it takes work, and it takes, uh, it takes effort, and it takes time to do it. Uh, so I'm trying to expand that universe, and hopefully the more people there are, the more ways I'll find to get around the control of the state. And it, one of the advantages of globalization, the beauty of globalization, one of the powers today of the rise of nationalism and the, and the, the attacks against it's called globalism, which is, a, which is a false concept, a horrible one. The beauty of globalization is movement for which is move. But also, that technology is not focused in one place. Let's say the United States goes to hell. It's probably going to happen. Let's say it goes to the dark meters in the United States. The knowledge to build a computer is still in Australia. The knowledge to build a computer is still in China. There's still engineers in in uh, you know in Europe. So whereas the moment fell, all knowledge disappeared. The knowledge today is so dispersed that I don't think you can make it completely disappear. So you, in a particular geographic area, you might have problems, but I, I do think that freedom have, will advance, has to advance, ways around these controls will exist as long as we're an open, globalized society. Globalization is a huge value. Uh, so I, I have a different view of what the real struggle is. Maybe I think my macro view. I, I, I think the struggle ultimately is a philosophical one. It's, it's, a, it's a struggle for, for the human mind and the human soul. And technology can certainly help, but I don't think that technology can win it. I, I really think this is ideas. And it's about changing people's ideas. It's about expanding the number of people who, who, who believe in, in that they own their own life and that, that they should be guided by a particular set of tools to achieve a successful life. Uh, and I think that's a hard battle to fight. It's hard to challenge the prevailing philosophy. It's hard to challenge the prevailing ethics and epistemology, the way people view politics. I think politics and economics are relatively easy. I actually think we won that debate 50, 60 years ago. I, I, you know, it's, it's done. We won every economic argument. We've got answers to every economic question. There's no, there's nothing, you know, there's still stuff to do, but there's not a huge amount to do. I, I really think this is our fundamental philosophical ideas where I think we haven't invested and haven't really kind of done the work necessary to win the battle. I think Ayn Rand is one of the few that even devotes any time and attention to this, I think, why she's so important for, for, any, for any movement dedicated to liberty and dedicated to freedom. She is the philosopher of that movement, and if you don't accept as the philosopher of that movement, it's at your cost. You will lose, in my view. Uh, it's about morality. It's about these kind of ideas. We need to expand the number of people dedicated to these ideas. Uh, and that takes a long time, and that's why long-term I'm optimistic because I believe truth wins out in the end. Truth always wins out in the end. I just don't know what in the end means. Uh, and it, it's probably decades, and it's probably going to be bumpy along the road. But you know, the good signs here. Man. A friend of mine who is a uh, committed objectivist and uh, so committed free marketer, uncompromising, will probably on Tuesday get elected to the Israeli parliament and be one or two of the only kind of objectivists in. You know, in office, in a, in a, in a, uh, in a, in a thing. Now, I don't think you can get a lot done in politics, but I think it reflects something about the growing size, and we can actually elect somebody, right? You've got enough people to vote for. So, uh, I, think, I think, I think it's a, generally, I think it's a great time to be alive. Yeah. I'm close like ideas, close like this. It's a great time to be alive. I mean, the fact that I live in Puerto Rico, you can live down, we have access to this amazing technology. I don't even know what Paul was talking about. But I have no idea the that technology, but just the simple technology that I use is to me a wonder. And, you know, some of us live actually lived before there were cell phones and actually lived before there were computers. Uh, I mean PCs, and the 
improvement in the quality of life that's happened over the last 30 years is by everything that they tell you. It's stunning, it's amazing, it's due to whatever freedom is left in the world. Don't let them take that away from you.